I don't know about you, when I'm looking for a plumber, I like to read my reviews. HomeAdvisor.com gave me some reviews on our sponsor, Art of Plumbing. Called them. They arrived on time. Immediately found the plumbing issue and fixed it right the first time. I called them last year and it was great. I called them again this year because I had a problem again. They came out, they fixed the problem. They even gave me solutions to help stop the problem in the future at 541 9405. Welcome in to Other People's Shoes. Of course, you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for joining us. And may I say, Merry Christmas to you. I know it's a little early, but I love Christmas. I just love everything about it. Boy, do we have a present for you today to unwrap of sorts. We're sitting down with a guest of mine that we recorded a couple months back, and uh, we're getting to share that with you today. So surprise, Merry Christmas. Today's episode is of mature nature. There is a lot of adult content that is shared and even some profanity. So please, if you're a younger listener, take that into account. But if you're an older listener, I advise you to listen to this. It's an amazing story. So please stay tuned for that. You're going to hear about my guest, Sean Dustin. He's the host of Nowhere to Go But Up, so stay tuned for that. But before we get to Sean, we have a special announcement. We've partnered with the Prickly Pear. That's a food truck here in Medford. And I would invite you to stay tuned till the end of the episode to hear how you can partner with us in our giveaway. We're excited about this December giveaway. So please stay tuned to the end of the episode for that. But until then, I hope you're ready for Sean, because you know I am. So here we go. Today, we sit down uh, with a gentleman that has uh, spent time in federal and state prison for drug trafficking. He didn't let that stop him. No, he did not. He became a blue-collar, hard-working guy. And this guy, again, even though he may have hit the bottom, he did not stay there. He is the host of Nowhere to Go But Up, which can be heard on iTunes and other platforms. Welcome in my guest, Sean Dudston. Sean, did I, I think I butchered your last name, so you might want to say it one more time. Did I get it right? Dustin. Uh, yeah, Dustin, like Hoffman, like the actor. Nice. Well, Sean, thanks for coming on. Uh, we kind of met in a really weird circumstance. I always like to tell people kind of how we met. My wife, of course, always laughs at that. But uh, we met through a Facebook group uh, on podcasting, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, and so uh, I think the reason why I was excited about uh, talking with you, um, you obviously have some crazy experiences, and and I've listened to a couple of shows, but uh, one thing I want to do before we get too far down a road is, uh, Sean, what size shoe do you wear? I wear a size 13. 13? Holy smokes. That uh, dwarfs my little uh, 11s and uh, 10 and a half sometimes, but uh, do you have a favorite brand that you wear? Well, I wear work boots most of the time during the day, but uh, when I'm not, you might find me in some flip flops or uh, or if I'm going to wear tennis shoes to go to the gym. Usually, I buy stuff from Costco. I'm not really. Are you a big Costco fan? Um, I the reason why I like Costco is that when when I go there, I can get everything that I, I need there in one spot, and then that's it. Wow. Because so more... you're a single guy. So, you know, Costco is like a dream come true for you, right? Yeah, I mean, I can get T-shirts there. <laughs> they're, they're pretty reasonably priced. I can get, you know, a bunch of salad, you know, <laughs> whatever I could possibly need. You know, it, it's uh, it works out for me. That's awesome. I personally hate Costco. So um, I don't, well, I shouldn't say hate. Hate's such a strong word. I really dislike Costco. So that's just me. It's just too big and there's so many people and it's always crowded and it feels like Disneyland. And, and you know, because there's a lot of shiny things and look over here, look over here. And so anyway. Oh, yeah, it's meant to trap you, and it's definitely meant to fleece you of your money because every time – the one thing I do not like about Costco is I cannot leave there without spending at least 300 bucks every time I go. That's what I was just going to ask you. Like, what's your average ticket at checkout? So it's about 300 bucks. Yeah, unless it, unless I find something <laughs> like uh, an electronic or you – because know, I buy all that stuff there too. Yeah, so, that's awesome. You know. 
Um, so Sean, I, I said kind of at the onset, you know, we, we talked about, uh, as we were introducing you, um, this, this lifestyle that you had, and, and I say had, because you don't have it anymore, right? No, no, I, I, I don't, um, I don't practice in any of that kind of stuff that I, that I was involved in at all. Um, I pretty much, uh, resigned to doing things the right way. Um, and, and it's just, you know, you, you go through life, um, doing things a certain way. And at some point, if it's not legal or legit, you know, society has a place for you and it's usually not going to be a place you want to be. <laughs> so talk about that for a second. Like, like when was the first time you got introduced to drugs? Do you remember? Yeah. Well, the first time I actually smoked uh pot, I was, uh, I think my mom had taken away my, uh, Walkman and put me on <laughs> restriction and took away my Walkman. And, you know, I was a latchkey kid. So I mean, it's like, all right, well, if you're going to take away my stuff and you're going to try and hide it from me, it would probably do you a lot better to be in the house. Because if I'm in the house by myself, I can ransack all your shit. Can I, can I cuss on this? We'll, we'll work on that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I went through all of her stuff and, uh, I found a, a bong and, a and a little bit of weed and somehow I, j I knew what to do with it. I, I don't know how I never smoked it before. I think it's just cause I seen the, the bowl of the, of the bong that was in there and it was black and charred. So I just kind of put two and two together and I think I was probably around 10 or 11 I was old enough to ride my skateboard because I remembered as soon as I smoked, I, I took like a hit of it, coughed a lung out, went outside, immediately jumped on my skateboard. We lived on a hill, a steep hill, and I uh, I jumped on it and I rode all the way down to the bottom of the hill, didn't get speed wobbles, wasn't scared, and didn't crash. Wow. And I was like, holy moly, because, you know, it's like. I wasn't afraid. I used to be afraid. And so I realized at that young of an age that that substances took fear away. Right. So what year was that? Just to help me put it in context. Ooh, so I'm 45. I was born in 73. If I was 10, that would be like 83. Okay. So 83. Yeah. Most of our listeners are going to have to go Google what a Walkman is. So just be aware of that. <laughs> So, so there we are. So, uh, again, mentioning at the onset, right, <clears throat> that you, uh, you're not afraid to talk about this in any way, but you spent some time in not only federal, but state prison for drug trafficking. Like how does smoking pot at 10 fast forward all the way? And I don't know when you were, you know, what year, what years you served, but like, how does that evolution take place? Uh, well, it started way back before, uh, before that. So, I mean, the first, so what we know now, um, is the first five years of a child's life are when they figure out everything, like how to, how to interact with the world around them, whether it's, you know, if you're, if you grew up in an abusive home or a home that, that, you know, there's a lot of fighting, a lot of verbal abuse, I mean, all that stuff plays into how, I mean, you may not even realize it, but subconsciously you mimic what you saw or what you heard. And I grew up with a lot of that. So when my parents divorced, when I was around five, um, you know, my mom, you know, bought my dad out of the house, you know, kept us there, tried to keep it as stable as possible. But unfortunately, you know, in order to make money in the Bay area, the kind of money that, you know, a single mother would need to make, uh, you have to work in a city in San Francisco. And it's still kind of like that. Now the city is where, you know, if you want to make good money, go get a job in San Francisco. It's going to pay higher than anywhere else. So I was a latchkey kid at around, I don't know, I'd say three or not three. Um, I was in the third grade. And the reason how I became a latchkey kid is that we, I was in uh, daycare and for some reason I was really angry as a kid, man. I thought, you know, that my parents got a divorce. Um, I blame myself for it. Uh, I was just angry and I ended up getting kicked out of preschool or the daycare that I was at, which 
was right behind the elementary school that I went to. So my mom had a, a perfect setup and I screwed it up. So she had no choice but to enroll me in the school down the street from our house because this one was in the next city over. And I, you know, had to bring myself home, take myself to school, you know, walk to school, do all that stuff. So uh, being a latchkey kid, I don't really think is a good idea because you don't have any discipline. You don't, you, you know, you can pretty much do whatever you want, which I did. Uh, I got put on restriction tons of times and all I did with that is I was just, okay, well, I can't go outside. Well, then I'll just cause havoc inside. Let me get, let me get into anything that I can. Let me go through all your shit. Let me go through all your shit. <laughs> yeah. So, and, uh, so were there any brothers and sisters or was it just you? No, I had brothers and sisters, but they were 12 and 10 years older. So they were already out of oh, the house. So the they're time. long gone. So you really are kind of like an only child in a sense. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. And so, I mean, that was the beginning. That was the beginning of me really, all right, well, I don't need to do it. I can do whatever I want. You know, no one's going to tell me any different. And so I carried that on into adulthood. Um, I, the first time I tried methamphetamine, I was probably, uh, I think the summer, my, my son, the summer before I was a freshman in high school. And from that point on, it would just, that went downhill. Um, you know, I was doing, you know, getting, I mean, I'd already, I'd already been a bad kid. You know, I, I'd been bounced around, you know, from my dad's to my uncle's to back to here. Um, I ended up doing a 151, uh, 151 days at the boys ranch. Um, I'd gotten in trouble try, uh, after that and my mom, you know, declared me incorrigible. So, uh, what, I, is it, what does that mean? I, I've never heard that term before. Incor uh, incorrigible means yeah. you're just out of control. Okay. Like I can't control him. Okay. I have no, he doesn't listen. He did, he just does what he wants. So, and so I became a ward of the court. Gotcha. So and she almost so, like forfeited custody in a sense. Kind of. She gave me up to the state. Okay. She still had, she still like, I still live there, but if anything, if I got in any more trouble, I would be taken out of her custody and, 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 and put it in like place foster the, care or something. Yeah. So what ended up happening is I, I got another violation. I ran away or did something or who knows what there was, there was always something. Um, and so I ended up, they gave me a choice, either go to juvenile hall for nine, for hey, nine months or go to um, this drug rehab for six months and the drug rehabs go in. So I'm like, well, I'm going to go there. <laughs> Cause at least there's some yeah. girls there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, because that's you know, at the end of the day, that's you know, the only thing that motivated me was was girls. So, sure. I mean, you're at this point like 16 years old, right? Yeah, yeah. What 16 year old wouldn't be motivated by girls? Yeah, I get you. Okay. Yeah, I even I even ran away from that place just so I could get out and go and hook up with a chick <laughs> that was there. So I took one of the girls that was there and Man, we ran away. You are bad news bear. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that, that ended up happening. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I did, uh, that nine or that six months turned into 18 months because when you're in a drug rehab, it's not about the time. It's about your progress. Right. And I was manipulating my way through the whole thing and whether it was, you know, getting people from the emancipation house to bring me to, to bring me cigarette packs and I would sell them to, to the to the clients because we were only allowed to have like maybe five a day and but we had money right because we could buy sodas we could do all this other stuff so i would just sell cigarettes for you know dollar two dollars a piece you know for people that wanted them extra and so i was doing all kinds of stuff like this and finally they just they they were like look man if you're not you can keep you can keep doing this because you're not going anywhere <laughs> yeah you know, you're, until you until you you know show some progress, or they call it getting real, which means like you yeah. know sitting in the middle of a circle and crying and and saying you know and, and talking about all your problems. Which yeah, I, I, I'm sure you just love that, right? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I just I didn't do it, and I right. I fought it for as long as I could think, and then at some point I think I just realized, all right, well, you got to surrender if you're going to fucking win win this thing. Sure. So that's so, what I did. So that leads into something. So you, you, you mentioned kind of at the onset of, of our talk that, you know, you're 10, that's when you first kind of discover pot. And then you, you know, you mentioned doing, 
uh, methamphetamine. So do you really feel like there is a, a thing called a gateway drug? Cause I've heard people say that through the years and, and I'm curious your opinion on that. I don't know, man. I, uh, I've thought about that one too. Um, what made me want to do meth is that all my friends were doing it and nobody would let me try it. And so they were like, you know, because I guess, you know, I was the youngest one and nobody wanted to be responsible for, for turning me on to it. And so they would always just go and, and like, I just be hanging out and like, where'd everybody go? And they're all off doing lines or whatever it is that they're doing. And so the, how I first tried it was my dad married somebody down the street, um, and her sister was a stoner and her other sister, they were like, they were like bad news. And so they were like the biker, you know, tweaker type people. And I ended up getting it from her. So she's way older than me. And then, and let me fight and let me try it. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's how that happened. Wow. As far as being a gateway, I don't know, man, I think drugs are, what what pushes people to drugs or makes drugs uh or at least what pushes you to do drugs maybe right because you can't speak yeah yeah you know, i, I mean, get what you mean i can't i can't speak for everybody but right. i know what i know what drugs do and they alleviate um suffering really mm. yeah and if you really want to think about it i mean why do people why do people self-medicate they're suffering in some sort of way and this is a way to kind of put that suffering to the side and a lot of the times depending on whatever drug it is you know, whether if you're using heroin or, or the hardcore stuff like meth or, or anything else yeah you're putting it on the shelf but a lot of the times you're just making the problem even worse so when you come back to reality it's still there and it's 10 times worse than it was when you you decided you wanted to check out so is that is that mean the main reason maybe why you kept using all those years is just the fact that you were just running from pain and running from, you know, being real. No, I was lazy. Okay. I didn't know if you I, were I just running I from did. stuff. So that's why I was wondering. Yeah. I, I mean, I probably, there was probably a little bit of that. I mean, as well, but I think for me, I was just lazy. I didn't want to get a job. I didn't, I didn't have any skills. I didn't do what normal people did. You know, high school kids, what do you do you, when you're 16? If you, you know, you go and you get a job at the local, you know, fast food joint or, you know, sandwich shop or w whatever it is. Um, I didn't do that. So I've tried, you know, my, my whole thing was, is that I would, anytime that I could try to find a, a hack or a workaround to doing the things that I'm supposed to be doing, but if I can figure out how to get around them, that's what I always do. I always did. Um, I found the weaknesses in systems um, and patterns. And I still do to this day. I just don't act on them now. Like I can see vulnerabilities in all kinds of different stuff. And I just don't, I, I just don't act on it now. But prior, I, you know, anytime that there was a vulnerability or if I saw a crack in security, I would try to exploit it. So, what leads to federal prison? How, how does that happen? And, and maybe talk about what prison life is like, because for me, you know, being in your shoes, if, if we're going to get a little cliche on the show, so to speak, but I mean, I've, I have no concept of that. Like I, I mean, I've had relatives go to prison, but it's not from a federal level, usually state or even local level, but, um, but not on a federal level. So if you're willing, maybe kind of share that, that part of the story. Okay. So how that ended up happening is I moved. So I was living in Sacramento, California at the time. Um, I wasn't working. Uh, I was dating a stripper. Uh, cause I spent quite a few, a lot of time in strip clubs. Cause if I wasn't selling drugs in a, in a nightclub and I wasn't making any money, then I knew for sure that if I went to the strip club, I would, you know, make some money. So I had plenty of, of you know friends that were there i had plenty of women that you know I, I hooked up with that were there um and that sort of led me into i think i got uh her pregnant and then i also got into it with somebody who was really crazy and this if, if me and this individual cross paths 
the likeliness would have been that one of us wouldn't have walked away from the situation. So having a kid on the way, lost, not knowing what to do, kind of a coward because I didn't want to, you know what I mean? I talk a big game, but when it came down to it, I wasn't willing to put it, you know what I mean? I wasn't willing to. Uh, it wasn't a put up or shut up kind of thing. You weren't willing to. Yeah. Do okay. Yeah. So I ran. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, well, this is a perfect opportunity. Let's move to Vegas. You're a stripper. There's plenty of strip clubs there. I'm not working. It, this this works out great for me. I don't know about you, but it works out great for me. So let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that's what we did. And, you know, when you have problems, and, and for me, part of my problem was is that I wasn't very good with relationships. I, I didn't know how to treat the opposite sex. I used bullying tactics. I never beat up any any of my girlfriends, but I was definitely verbally abusive and bullying and just kind of like strong on my way through things. And it was what I, what I grew up with. It's what I saw. It was what was and modeled for you in a lot of respects. Yeah. Right. I mean, from what you're describing of your dad, right. Yeah. That. And then plus just being in that, in that lifestyle, right. you know I mean, the, the, the music that you're listening to, you're listening to rap music or whatever it is that, all that does is just just reinforce those ideas and those behaviors in your head, you know. And so you just would it just would seems you normal. say you had a view that women were more property than 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 anything? I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth by any means. To me, they weren't property. To me, I, they were just a means to an end. Okay. So you know, the the stripper she made a lot of money. It made it so I didn't have to work. I can go into the strip club and I used to, I used to laugh at this all the time. It's kind of screwed up, but you know, I would be in there watching her, uh, uh, get a lap dance and this dude spending a hundred, you know, 200, 300 bucks on him, on her. And I'd just be th thinking to myself, what a dummy. She's just going to go home and spend that shit on me and you're not going to get anything out of it. <laughs> That's terrible, you know, but I get what you're saying. You know, I mean, that, that falls into that lazy lifestyle that you kind of probably adopted even in Vegas, right? And it goes into manipulation, right? Yeah. Which I learned at a very young age how right. to manipulate people, how to how to how to turn situations into my advantage, but by sort of like psychologically not. It's hard to explain, man. Yeah, no, I, I think I get you. So you're in Vegas, and then how do the how does the jail thing come into play? All right, so I I. I danced around with jail quite a bit i'm in vegas me and her split up um i screw up immensely and she uh what does she do she gets my rights terminated um which i allowed to happen which uh which i haven't seen my daughter that one since she was 18 months old and i just kind of let her go mm -hmm. i didn't fight for her i didn't do anything i just figured she'd probably be better off without me which was just a justification for sure. me to keep fucking, uh, to keep doing what I wanted to do and not pay attention to my responsibilities. Right. Um, I got a DUI, uh, took care of that. Uh, what else did that happen? I left this, I left the state, went to, went to Phoenix, tried to get straight there. Didn't work. Came back to Vegas um, ended up getting a job at a strip club in North Las Vegas and hooked up with another dancer there. And she was a meth addict and I hadn't been touching it up to this point. Like I'd left it alone for about a year, year and a half. And I knew as soon as I walked in the door, cause she called me up. She's like, Hey, you want to hang out? And she lived right down the street from me at the time. And I'm like, sure. All right. So I went over there. And I seen her smoking it and I was and the first thing out of my mouth is I when I when I seen her, I was like, I should just walk I should just turn around and walk out the door right now. I said that out loud mm -hmm. as I'm still walking towards her and I sat down and fucking got high. Wow. From that point on, I was buck wild. I was selling ounces, you know, buying buying pounds of, of meth, selling ounces, just going crazy. Um, I had dealt with somebody for a year, I guess he had gotten, uh, uh, busted by somebody. He set me up with a, a confidential informant. I sold to that guy seven times, um, seven on seven different occasions. And the whole time, the, the, 
I was under, under surveillance. Wow. You know, I had guns. I had, they would, they, when they came in to get me, they came in like I was Noriega. Seriously. Wow. Like flashbangs, concussion <laughs> grenades, everything in a small apartment. And, uh, so that's yeah. not the rock bottom. That's not the moment where you're like, okay, I'm done. I'm out. What is it going to take to get clean? That's not the moment. No. And, and I almost died that night too, because when they came in, I, I had this, this elaborate stereo system with about 85 speakers and I had it on pretty loud. It was like about two o'clock in the morning. Uh, my girlfriend and her friend were asleep in the other room. I don't know how they were asleep with the radio, with the TV on as loud as I had it. I was in the back uh, working on because I was I was printing money at the same time. I I figured out how wow. to how to how to do something, and so I was trying to to do that in the back room. And I heard I heard some stuff. I'd gotten rid of all the guns because I'd I'd felt like something was gonna go like, down. Yeah, I just had this feeling that my time was running out. Yeah. And that I was, you know, just something just didn't feel right. And I just, you just have that sixth sense. And um, so, yeah, they I, they hit one of the, the flashbangs and I, I had double pane glass windows and I tinted the outside. So the, the, the flashbang made it through the first window. But since it had tint on it, it slowed it down to the point where it couldn't make it through the second window or the second pane, and it bounced back on him and blew up on them. Uh -oh. Their police, yeah, their police dog bit one of the cops because it scared them. So when they came in, they were already pissed. Yeah, I would imagine so. Dude. <clears throat> so, so I'm in the back room. There's another person with me who's watching me do what I'm doing. We both look at each kind other. Kind of like your I, your little disciple or your your trainee, if almost maybe. No, it okay. was just somebody who wanted something, and okay. I was like, "All right." Gotcha. Uh, so, I had one gun left, and it was a small, uh, little, little like a twenty-two or a twenty-five, and it was a, a semi, and it fit in the palm of my hand. Um, I thought somebody was was like doing a drive-by on my house. Honestly, I, I didn't know that the police were there, and this whole thing happened right so the flash the first flashbang uh blew up on them they slugged the back gate because there was a uh there was a deadbolt on it right so they used a shotgun slug boom that one threw another uh flashbang in from the other way and so by the time all these hit none of they didn't they didn't give me a concussion or they didn't affect me in any way because they all blew up in, in areas that i wasn't there so i grabbed my gun and I have it like down at my, so picture you're walking, you're going down a hallway and you're going to look around the corner and you have the gun pointed at your foot down by your, by your, um, by your knee. And the only reason they couldn't see this gun, because right at the, the at end of the hallway, if you look at the, uh, towards the right, the doorway is right there. Well, in front of that is a big, you know, one of those big, uh, projection TVs. Mm-hmm. So they couldn't see me. All they could see was they could see me, but they couldn't see that I had a gun. So as soon as I saw them, I saw the SWAT shield. I ditched the gun behind the, the TV and I dove on the ground and put my hands on my head. Had they seen that gun, guess what? That's life, right? That's it. I'm done. Yeah. You're I'm dead. dead. Yeah. Because they would have shot. Yeah. They would have just shot me and killed me. Because they, they would have thought that's an aggressive move, you know, whatever. Yep. Yeah. So man, that that's yeah, insane. That was... That's that's ABC worthy, by the way. I, I mean, I'm not trying to glorify, you know, your experience by any means, but man, that is crazy, dude. I I've got some. I got so many stories. That <laughs> you are do, crazy and like I know that. you've shared some on on your show, and uh, and and I definitely want to want to give you some time for that too. But so so you end up going to jail then, right? Yeah. So so here's the funny thing. <laughs> So they bring the dogs in, they do all their deal. Um, I, I ended up putting the drugs and all my cash in one of those uh, VCR TV combos <laughs> in the VCR slot. That's awesome, because they would never look there, right? No, no but the VCR was actually in the corner, uh, up, raised up, so where the dog couldn't smell. They, mm. Their nose is everywhere else, they couldn't smell. So they missed the whole thing. So as soon as they, they let me out three days later, because I didn't have any priors, Mm -hmm. so they let me out on my own recognizance and 
I went and grabbed my stuff, grabbed my, you know, cleaned up everything. Most everything was kind of cleaned up by the time I got out, but I moved to a different spot and I was like, well, they're just going to have to catch me if they can now. Cause I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to turn myself in and I wasn't going to go back until I got caught. Right. I was really, honestly, when I try to tell people what my mindset was, I honestly think that I was just trying to kill myself. Um, but not in the way that you think just killing myself by having fun partying and doing whatever I wanted to do. Cause I've OD'd like two or three times. I've almost died a couple of other times in different ways. And for some, I just couldn't, it just wouldn't happen, man. Like something out there is just keeping me safe and keeping me from, from expiring. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was crazy. So I ended up uh, getting another place doing some other stuff. Uh, finally about like three or four months later, I, uh, am trying to do some other, some other stuff. I did I wasn't selling drugs anymore. I was doing uh, fraud now. So credit card fraud and, and, uh, hanging paper, which is right. Uh, making checks and doing all that other stuff, IDs and, and things like that. And so I, I made a mistake and it was a, it revolved around trying to get, trying to cheat on my girlfriend at the time. And I, and I ended up getting busted that way. Hmm. And so, so it wasn't the drugs that brought you down. It was, it was the fraud. Well, yeah, it was, it was a fraud because yeah. I had, I had done a, uh, I'd gotten a room in an assumed identity and I didn't realize that whenever you're in Vegas, if you go to a weekly or one of the seedy hotels down in off of Boulder highway or that area, um, they send the, they send a picture of your, or a, a copy of your ID to Metro and Metro runs your shit to make sure you're not a fugitive. Wow. Well, what I didn't realize is that the person whose identity I stole was a black guy and I'm not black. <laughs> <laughs> Minor so technicality, right? Little, Minor yeah, technicality. That's, that's hilarious. <laughs> that's probably the best part of the story for me. Yeah. So anyways, I, 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 they put me in the back of the cop car. The guy that, that ends up showing up, he was a, uh, he was at the first place that I got raided at where I had, tons and tons of like stolen equipment and, and just yeah. everything I had in my house was crazy. And he, and he looked at me and he's like, I was, I've been waiting to, for you to pop back up again. I knew you would. And I was like, all right, I was so tired, man. I just wanted to go to sleep. I didn't care. Yeah. Like I was in the back of the cop car. It was like 110 degrees. Oh, and I'm is hot. Yeah. Yeah. I'm falling asleep, just wanting to go to bed. And so I'm like, dude, whatever you want, let's just get it over with. What you want me to take you to my house and give you all my stuff? Fine, let's go. Yeah. And so that's what I did. I went and I gave him everything that I had. And uh, unfortunately, he had a uh, Secret Service agent I was on a ride along with him. And that agent picked up the federal charge of me having a shotgun in, a, in an assumed identity. Hmm. And I had purchased that shotgun because two weeks prior to that, I had gone out, uh, on a, on a run and I can't really talk about what I did cause I didn't get in trouble for it, Sure, but it, it landed me, it, it landed me, you know, quite a bit of cash. And when I came back into town, our roommate at the time, she'd been calling me for, you know, or calling my, my girlfriend and, and she never calls. Like she doesn't care what we're doing, but she was just like, when are you going to be back? When are you going to be back? When are you going to be back? And so I knew something was up. So when I yeah. came before I, before I stopped back to the house, I dropped all the cash off somewhere and hit it. And then as soon as I got home, I got, uh, uh, oh, what do they call that, man? When, uh, it was somebody who said he was a hell's angels guy. And he's like, dude, I'm taxing you. He put us all on the ground at gunpoint and then tried to basically uh, almost like a citizen's arrest from the sound of it. Well, no, not a citizen. He oh. was just, he was trying to steal from me. Oh, gotcha. Oh, I see. So he was taxing me because he had heard and he thought that oh, I was coming back gotcha. with a bunch of drugs. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so yeah, yeah. Cause he was, he's a hell's angel. So he's kind of above the law in a lot of respects, maybe. Yeah. I don't even know if that's what he was. That's what he claimed to be. So sure. who, who knows? Who knows? Um, I ended up, that ended up not happening. Cause I, I talked my way out of it and I'm like, guy, you're, you're silly. I mean, you want to, you really want to steal this little bit here when you can have all of this over here if you just work with me <laughs> yeah the little, little jedi mind trick there that was awesome 
Yeah, and then he bought it. And then after that, I went and I bought that shotgun, and I was going to kill the guy. Hmm. And I ended up getting arrested before that happened, and that probably saved my life too. Hmm. Yeah. So what was the rock bottom, Sean? You, I mean, you talk about it a lot on your show, I'm sure. Don't want to give too much yeah. of your episodes away because I, I do want people to go and listen to them. But but is there, was there a rock bottom? The rock bottom didn't happen until I got out of prison because I wasn't done. I got out in 2006, and I didn't stop using until 2010. And something – I don't know what happened. Um, I, I don't know what the switch was in my head. But I remember – like I, just, I remember being on the side of the road, of the highway – and I had been chasing my girlfriend because she was like, or my wife at the time, because I, when I was doing all this stuff in 2010, I went AWOL for my marriage for about a good four or five months and just disappeared into the, into the seedy underbelly of fucking crime in San Francisco and, and other areas. And I don't know, I was, I was done. I, my life was a mess. I was tired of, of disappointing everybody. I was disappointed in myself. I just, I just, I didn't like me. I didn't like who I was. I didn't like how I was treating people. I didn't like the fact that I, I treated women the way that I did. And I was just literally, I was on my knees on the side of the highway, a, a busy highway with my hands in my head and, and, and or my head in my hands. And I was just bawling uncontrollably. And I was just like, dude, I can't do this anymore. And I ended up doing another another 90-day uh, violation. And before I went on this violation, I was like, well, I don't want to be kicking drugs while I'm in there because I'm going to a, uh, uh, a county facility, which is a lot more dangerous than prison. You wouldn't think that it would be, but it is because you got a lot of guys in there that think they know what prison's like and you know they may have had a, a celly or something that told them what prison was like but and then they just try to to be that way but it's a it's a very dangerous place so i was like well i can't do that while i'm there so i got off drugs and i stopped smoking and doing and, and cleaned up before i went on this violation when i got out i was just just didn't want to do it anymore i saved my uh, apprenticeship program and by the time two, 2015 rolled around, um, everything, I turned it all around. So when I went to prison, though, I was scared. I'd never been before. I'm a big guy. I'm like 240 pounds. Well, I was probably about 225 then, 6'1". So I'm, I'm, I'm a decent size, you know, linebacker. I can hold my own. Yeah. Um, the Niners but, might be able to use a linebacker like you, by the way. Yeah, Honestly. but I just, yeah, I, I was just, I was just, I was afraid though, because I didn't know how it would be. And when I was in uh, fighting my case, I ended up getting jumped by a bunch of uh, Mexican gangbangers because I look Hispanic, but I'm I'm more white than anything else. So I had to make a decision after I got jumped because I wasn't running with anybody. And then the whites approached me and they're like, "Hey, man, what are you?" are you white? Are you Hispanic or, or what, what is it? And I'm like, nah, I'm, 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 I'm both. But I mean, I, I identify as white. I don't, I don't have anything in common with, you know, the, the gangbangers. I don't have anything in common with the, with the, the, the Mexican nationals. I don't speak Spanish. I just look like it. And I like Mexican food. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I ended up rolling with them. But what I told them was, is that, um, that I'm Italian and that's what explains the dark complexion. Hmm. And so from the time that I, I, I was there till the time I got out of prison, um, I, I identified as Italian that way. I didn't, because I knew that if I rolled with the Mexicans, they would use my size and try to get me to, you know, do their dirty work for them and possibly catch more time. And that's not what I was trying to do. I had to do a lot of different things in there. I had to, um, you know, some of the stories that you hear are true. Some of the stories that you hear on, on TV or, you know, those, those jail shows, they're absolutely true. 
I was in a medium security, so I didn't have to experience a lot of that stuff. But if I'd have been in a max, oh, yeah, you know, people are getting stabbed all the time. People are getting raped. Um, I never saw any of that stuff go on, but I did have to um, uh, invoke violence on other people. Like the, the, the prison guards, would, if there was a child molester that was a white guy, the prison guards would come and tell the 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 shot caller for the whites after after you know the middle of the night hey, tomorrow there's going to be a child molester coming in you guys need to do whatever you need to do wow. and so yeah i mean it's it, the whole thing's dirty <laughs> that's so wow oh um, my gosh i have no again no concept of that right i mean you're probably going to hear that a lot from me but so so I want to go back to that side of the road moment, if we can. Can we do that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, go for it. So, you know, we, we talked pre-show. You know, I have, I'm have i a person of faith. You know, I, I love Jesus. I grew up in the church. Um, you know, I, I the lifestyle you're describing it is something I would see on a TV show or on a movie, right? It it like New Jack City or, or you know, Boys in the Hood or something like that. I'm I'm just trying to reference something that, that I saw as a kid that I was like, oh, those are those are gang guys or you know, whatever. Those are drug dealers. That's all I have. That's my only, you know, point of reference. Thank you. Thank you, Ice Cube. Um but my question is that that side of the road moment, what led to that? Where you're like literally at your wits end, like crying out to something. Who are you crying out to in that moment, do you feel like? I was just, I was crying out to just confusion. Like, like how did, how did, how did I let my life get to this point? Um, and I don't know, I, I don't know what, what it was, what the significance was. I think I was, I was just trying to like, you know, when you do things so much then nobody fucking believes you anymore. Oh, I'm going to change. I'm I, at this time is going to be different. Uh, uh. So I think that the culmination of all the times and all the bullshit, all of it just came up at one time. And I'm trying to convince my, my wife at the time, which is ex-wife now, um, that it's going to be different and I need you and I love you. And you know what I mean? All of this sad story, you know, boo hoo. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, you know, all that stuff. And it just, you know, it just wasn't working. And I think that I had realized at that point that dude, all your, all your get out of jail free cards are gone. What are you going to do? Was it empty? I mean, was it just, I mean, I mean, you've done some things, you've had money, you've, you've, you know, you've, you've had, obviously you've had women, you've had drugs. I mean, at the end of the day, is it all just empty? Would you say? Yeah. Cause none of it's real. None of it's real. It's that lifestyle is not real. It's, it's, it's a facade. It's a false reality. It gives you it gives you self-esteem, but it's a false sense of self-esteem. It's nothing that, it's nothing that sticks. You know what I mean? The, the, the little bit of, of, uh, confidence that you're getting is confidence through means of, of getting over on somebody or, you know, let, let's just say there would be a lot of times when I would just make excuses or do things just because I knew they would make me feel like shit. And I have an excuse to go get high. Right. You know what I mean? So it was, it was just constantly a, a, a battle with myself. It was with nobody else. I mean, it seemed like it was with everybody else, but at the end of the day, it was just a battle with me. Do you believe in a higher purpose? Um, I believe in the universe. I don't particularly uh, call, call it God. I grew up Catholic. Um, I never had, you know, any experiences <laughs> with a Catholic priest, you know, or any of that, but sure. I, uh, I grew up that way. And for some reason it just didn't, it's just, I, I didn't like it. I can't, I don't know. Maybe it's, I feel silly praying to a God, especially when, if you get like, when I, I get into a lot of conspiracy stuff and a lot of, uh, um, things like that. And I think that the Bible has a lot of good things 
just like every everybody's religion has is a good blueprint to live your life if that's the if that's the direction you choose to go whether it's the quran or the bible or you know uh judaism uh the watchtower society whatever it is that you want to go i mean they, they're all good blueprints to live your life i don't deny that at all i just feel like it's a, a tool that was used to keep the masses in line when nobody's looking you know yeah that's an so, interesting thought hmm. um, i always like that topic because i never know how people are going to answer it i'm never worried about being offended by the way and i think you know that just from our, our brief conversation again pre-show but um as i as you look back over your life was there any moment that you're like man I regret this or man, I wish this didn't happen. Do, do you ever have that moment where you're just like looking back? Yeah. My, my biggest regret is, uh, my relationship with my first daughter and not, and not fighting for her and turning my back and, and choosing partying and drugs over my responsibilities. I took me, it took me a while. I stayed drunk for about six months after after that whole situation. And I was in, that's when I went to Phoenix to try to do a geographical, which never works because you, the problem isn't in, in Vegas. The problem isn't in uh, uh, Phoenix. The problem is wherever you are because you're the problem. <laughs> yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. So, so Sean, what leads you to help people now? I know you're doing your show and, and, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit, but but what leads you down this road now of where you really want to help people and, you know, kind of stay out of that lifestyle that, that you were once in? Well, once I, once I started, um, I got questioned about this one time, the way that I think about it, um, I put it in terms versus risk versus reward. Uh, and an individual asked me, well, why wouldn't you, do it right versus wrong. And I'm like, I don't know. Cause I'm not a right versus wrong kind of guy. Cause I, I just never really looked at things that way for me to get this. It was risk versus reward. So in the beginning, when I didn't have anything, what was I risking and what were the rewards? The rewards were I could do whatever I want, party, drugs, sex, this, that I, I wasn't losing anything. Cause I didn't have anything to lose really. Once I 2015 came around or, or you know, I, I, stopped doing all of that stuff and decided to turn my life around and, and, you know, be a, a productive person. Um, my risk became a lot higher because now I have a six figure income. Now I have this or I have that, or I have to, you know, you, you just have things that if I want to risk this, what's the reward going to be? The reward started to not outweigh the risk. And so that just kind of naturally took me out of it. And I'm like, all right, well, I don't want to, I don't want to, I've, I've worked this hard to get here. So I don't want to just frivolously blow it on something stupid. And, you know, there was more things that, that, that led to that, but I mean, in a nutshell, that's kind of how I did it. Um, and then what, what was the other part of the question? Cause I don't think that was the, I didn't answer the question. I answered something else. You're good, buddy. Um, so, so one, what, um, why do you feel so led to help people now? And then does that kind of lead into why you're doing your show? Okay. The reason why I decided to, to go this route is that I knew I had all these stories and I had all these experiences and I had come from a place that most people don't make it back from. Um, I'd almost died so many times and, you know, through using, through drug overdoses, through you know, just behavior, uh, at risk behavior. Um, and I was like, you know, the only way that you can keep what you have, and this is this is going back to the program, because I'm not actually in recovery, but I used recovery to get off of, of the hardcore drugs. I barely drink now, and if I do anything, it's I'll, I use marijuana, uh, edible marijuana for pain. I, I had a seven-year opiate addiction that I kind of skipped over, um, and I used that to get off of it. So my inspiration to do this is I just want to make sure that people don't um, uh, can learn from me instead of, instead of having to go through the whole thing yourself. Um, I know that that's kind of silly because most people have to go through it 
in order to get through it. But if I could just reach one person and, and, and keep them from making the same mistakes that I did, then that's worth it for me. And this is also therapeutic. The whole, the whole podcast thing, uh, what I tell people is, I mean, I'm sure that they don't realize that I'm pro- you're probably helping me more than I'm helping anybody else because I get to release some of these stories and, and, and you know, my truth and get it out there. And then I get to hear from other people and hear their stories and we exchange. And if other people are listening or they, you know, they reach out to me, it's rewarding. And, and even though I'm not making a lot of money doing this, actually, I'm not making any money doing this. It's costing me money, but it's worth it in the end to me. You know, the people that I've talked to, I've talked to people from all over the world, man. I've talked to people from the Congo. I've talked to a, a lady um, in India who was a domestic violence survivor. And like that played right into to my thing. You know what I mean? And, me, and we started talking. I'm like, hey, man, you know, I, I got to admit something to you. I was an abuser, you know, not physically, but I was a a verbal and mental abuser to five of my relationships. And that plays a big part in what I'm doing because I think men and boys have a skewed vision or skewed idea of what it means to be a man. You know, we all have, you know, everything that we were taught 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it's all different now. You know, we're, we're, we're living on bl- blueprints that don't match today's society. And yeah, so I agree with you on a hundred percent, um, on that. I really do. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt your thoughts. Sorry, but I, I just, I wanted to jump in because I just, I feel that way. You know, my dad was a Marine and so he was gone a lot too. And so I was pretty fortunate, you know, to have, you know, guys in church that kind of brought me under their wing and kind of showed me what it was like to be a man and to, you know, to respect women and to honor women. And, you know, my wife and I have been married, um, you know, this summer it'll be 18 years, sorry, 19 years, right? 19 years. Yeah. Wow. Congratulations. And, you know, we've known each other since high school. So, you know, we're the prototypical, you know, high school sweethearts and yada, 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 but um, you know, I, I'm not going to say our marriage has ever been perfect because it's not. I mean, we've had our challenges just like anyone else, but to me, I, I love exactly what you're saying because I think that is the, the crooks of our, of, of our society today of where we're at is this idea that men are not being shown how to be a man. I mean, you could, you could teach a guy how to fix things and how to do this, how to do that, but how's he going to treat that woman? How's he going to treat that lady in his life? And, and what are we doing? Because again, you're talking about your, your story is, is pretty similar to most people's stories. And that is dad wasn't in the picture. So if dad's not in the picture, where do you get that male role model? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I didn't have one. So I look to, I mean, my babysitter, a lot of the times is a TV. So I, I have, I have so much useless crap from the nineties and, and TV stuck in my head like if, if you wanted to do 90s uh what, what do they call that? 90s uh, trivia or whatever yeah 90s uh pop culture trivia yeah, yeah. Huh, dude i'd kill it you would kill it <laughs> that's awesome um yeah so i mean basically i mean it, it, it's it just it boils down to that i didn't like the person that i was and i'm i'm a very uh uh introverted like like i know how to i don't know like analyze myself like I don't, I don't ignore things when, when, uh, like when I hurt somebody, I, I feel bad about it, you know? And I, it, I just, there were so many of those that just kept happening and I, I just had to pull away and I, I got out of the relationship that I was in. It was toxic. And what actually stopped me and, and put me on where in my path that I'm on now is me and my ex would fight all the time and we still do, but it's not, it's it's easier to walk away when you're not living with them anymore. Um, but I, my daughter, she was, we were arguing about something and she was behind me. And all of a sudden, we, like five minutes later, we're in an argument, yelling, slamming doors. I was like, where, where's my, where's, where's Sienna? And she was in the furthest point of the house, um, hiding hmm. and like in a corner. And I was like, I don't like to think of, I was like, I, God, was that me? Yeah. Was that me when I was a kid? Yeah. 
And from that point on, I just, I, I, uh, sorry, man. That's okay. <clears throat> from that point on, I, I couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't do it anymore. And I, I didn't want, I didn't want her growing up thinking that that was how things are supposed to be. That this is how men are supposed to treat women. So when she runs across that 20 years later and she's in the same situation, if I stayed, she's going to stay. If I leave, I can teach her the right way. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I would say to that, and I would push back against that, of course, but I would just say, and again, I don't know your full situation, but I would just say, man, be the dad to her that you didn't have, you know, and I know you are, you probably are, and and you're probably working that out, but, you know, I miss, I I miss my dad, you know, I, 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 my, my birthday was back in March, and for, you know, I'm 39 now, I would say for 30 years, I walked through life not knowing if my dad loved me, not knowing if my dad was proud of me, not knowing if my dad was, was even accepting of me. Right. And I was bad. I mean, I wasn't as bad as you, but I had an anger issue. still kind of do in a lot of respects, but something crazy happened when on that March, this last March. And, uh, he said for the first time that he was proud of me and proud of who I had become. And I had waited 30 years to hear that. In fact, I drove home that night and I looked at my wife and I said, babe, you heard that, right? Like, like I wasn't dreaming that really happened, right? She's like, yeah, how do you feel? And I was like, like I can do anything because my dad's proud of me. So I don't know if you've told your daughter that yet, but man, that could be, that could be the open door that you may need. Not that I'm your psychologist, because I'm not. I'm a podcast host. Yeah, but, yeah but, no, see, uh, I, we, I move five minutes down the road, and I pick her up every day from daycare, and I have her for three hours. So I made sure that I didn't, I didn't get out of the picture. I'm very much present in the picture. That's awesome, man. That is awesome. And it's probably because I'm uh, because of how I dealt with the first one that I'm like hyper, like no, this isn't going to happen this time. Hypersensitive, make, almost, yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, this is, I'm, I'm super, like, you know, co parent. <laughs> nice. Uh, last thing, and then, uh, then I want to play a game. And then, of course, I want to give you some time uh, to talk about your show. So, um, how does perseverance play into your story? I mean, we've kind of heard about it, but your perspective, how does, how do you feel when you think of that word perser- perseverance? And how does that play into what you've done and where you've come from? Well, um, stubbornness, a lot, a lot of it is the perseverance isn't really perseverance. It was just being stubborn, um, and not wanting to be a statistic in any form. Yeah. Um, I've just always found a way. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if it's because I have something that's guiding me. I don't have, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't know why why I haven't failed. Um, I just don't give up. I, you know, I, I come back and I regroup and even now today, I mean, it's, you know, my life isn't perfect. I make mistakes still. I get angry still. I say things that I wish I didn't, you know, I'll slam a door and, 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 or, you know, in anger. And, you know, it, I mean, it's a, it's a constant battle. Um, but it's a battle that still needs to be fought because there's plenty of people out there that are struggling with the same thing and that need to know how to get through that. Um, you know, and podcasts are amazing, man. They're amazing outlets and amazing tools for us to learn from other people. And it's unlike anything else because it's people that are in your head yep. and you become friends with them. Even though it's a one-sided friendship, when I start a podcast, uh, when I, when I, when I first start a show and it's at the first episode and let's say it's somebody that's not popular, I get to grow with him. Yeah. And uh, I think that's, that's, that's so cool. 
It is so cool. So, uh, Sean, tell us about your show. So, uh, nowhere to go but up. Where Where are you at? I know you're you're on iTunes because because I found you there. That's where I listen most often because I'm an iPhone guy. Shout out iPhone. But but where else are you? I'm on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, a handful of other ones that I don't even know. <laughs> There's too many, right? Because we we go everywhere. I'm probably like you, right? I yeah, always tell I mean, people, I, if you're on a platform and I'm not there, tell me, and then I'll be on that platform. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I tried to figure out how to get on all these different platforms, but I just, at the end of the day, I'm, I usually just send people to my lips and podcast page because yeah. from there you can go hit the buttons wherever right. you want. If you want to exactly. go to iTunes, yep. you know, figure it out, or you can go to my, or I'll send people over to uh, my Instagram and you can go to my link tree and it'll do the same thing. Nice. Okay. Yeah, so I mean that's where I'm at. Uh, my show is about bottoms and how people get through them, life struggles, and then in between that, you'll find episodes of things that interest me or variety, um, or friends like you. Like I had a friend on there. I think you probably listened to the one where I talk about ecstasy. When yeah, I listened to that one. What, number seven where we talk about discovery bay and yeah and, the swingers and, and by the way I, I had to google discovery bay and in fact i was talking about it with a coworker. i'm like man i want to live down there and then i looked at house prices and i'm like yeah i'm good yeah it's, no it, you don't want to yeah you don't want to live down there. down there but it looks gorgeous so maybe i'll drive through there and like like look at all the houses i can never afford but uh but there we are so yeah, it's better when you're on the water doing it. Like yeah. I have jet skis and I'll and I'll launch out in Discovery Bay and I'll just zip through some of the some of the areas where you see the docks and the houses and that. it's pretty cool. Yeah, that sounds fun. So are are you weekly? Yeah, I have a weekly a weekly show. Okay. Uh, and what, well, what days just, do you usually come out? I try to do it uh Thursdays. Okay. So you're a Thursday guy. Okay. That's cool. No judgment. Yeah, either no it'll judgment. come out it'll come out Wednesday night midnight or something while i'm as i'm finishing up or yeah. i'll wait until the morning and, and release it gotcha uh, so yeah it's it's been it's been pretty good uh I'm, i just uh released my 10th episode today so go and listen to it uh so i've got about like 15 or 16 in the bank right now that's awesome keep keep plugging away you know that's what i can always tell people so uh i want to play a game with you but first i want to give you a quote that i came across that is really uh powerful i want to get your thoughts on it and then we'll play this game so um i'm building a fire every day i train i add more fuel at the right moment i light the match what comes to mind when you hear that uh, what comes to mind is is a similar one that I used for myself, but it's about um, what you feed is what grows. So if you feed the negative part of your life, the negative part of your your personality, then that's what's going to grow. If you feed the positive part of your life, the positive part of your personality, the good things that you want to do, then that's going to grow. So whatever it is that you want to grow, you know, feed it. You want to be negative and you want to, you know, be hurtful, then, you know, go that route. But if you want to be a good person and help other people and just do right, then feed that part of your life. And then that's what's going to grow. I like it. So, Sean, I always play a game on my show. It's called Senseless. Uh, it works better if people are face to face. But so I'm going to be your proxy roller. So I have a die in a University of North Carolina cup. It's light blue much like my office that I'm taping in right now. So I'm going to roll on your behalf. Are you okay with that? Yep. All right, so here we go. And you got a number two, which means you get to answer number two. So this is a game, like like I said, I like to call senseless. So here's the question. It's just a funny kind of way to end the show. So um, who's touching your life right now? Oh, that was a perfect one because I was trying to figure out how I was going to work this – this other podcast that I listen to that's really been uh, like inspirational for me. Sure. So it's somebody so, else's show, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's somebody else's show. And this, this is a guy I just interviewed recently. And uh, he's got a show called Latitude Adjustment. And he basically goes, and like, he's an investigative reporter. And he goes to these areas uh, in the world where, you know, they're, having crises uh like syria and and all these other places where 
mainstream media isn't picking up the stories of, of genocides and, and uh, violence and, and all kinds of crazy stuff that are, that are happening, wars, war zones. And he talks to people from those areas and kind of enlightens the, the general public about, you know, Hey, this is happening. This is real. Uh, you know, our tax dollars are going to, to, you know, our country is backing these other countries under our name using our tax dollars and all it's doing is feeding these these uh war criminals and and making them rich because none of the money and you know the aid that we send to other countries these these poor countries it never goes to them hardly any of it goes to them it goes to uh weapons it goes to military it goes to all these other things but it doesn't go to help the people and the populations that are that are desperate and he just kind of puts a light on it and does it in such a way that man you can't help but to to want to jump on board and 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 do something that's awesome i think i started his episode but i didn't finish it um because I was prepping for another guest too, but I want to go back. That to was your... a different one. That was a different report. Oh, that was a different report. Okay, so this one hasn't come out yet. No, no, no. I haven't. Okay. I haven't. I haven't done it yet. So, and you know, the funny thing is, is that I thought that I was a, I was a good interviewer, but I've only you know done it like ten, fifty. Well, I've done it more than that. But when you, there comes a time when you interview somebody who's of higher caliber than, than most of the people that you interview. And this was one of them. Like he'd been used to being, uh, uh, interviewed by real reporters, real journalists and everything else. And it really kind of like my episode 10, I go into it on the intro on, on how, you know what I mean? I was unprepared and like this dude was waiting for me to ask him questions. And I was like, asking questions but not asking questions it wasn't yeah. direct it was like roundabout sure and so yeah he just he he kind of schooled me but not in a bad way yeah he was totally cool about it but it it really pointed out like dude you've got some flaws in your game that you need to you know you need if you're gonna keep doing this you 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 can't just like half-ass it yeah no that's that's true so, uh, well, Sean, I want to say thanks again for coming on. Of course, Sean is the host of uh, Nowhere to Go But Up. Please uh, l- go listen to it, a couple episodes if you want, or all of them. He has a, a good catalog. Um, I am just thrilled anytime I get to do this because I love doing this and I love getting to meet different people. Um, Sean, you're awesome. Uh, I just want to continue to encourage you not only in your show but obviously as a dad and and just everything you got going on. So, uh, any last thoughts before we we uh, end it? No, just uh, pay attention. You know, don't 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 go through life asleep. You know, there's there's a lot going on that that you know we're complacent to in the world, in our own country, in our own politics, in everything that that's happening around us right now. Twenty twenty is coming. I don't know. I, I don't really want to talk about who's who's, you know, the guy that's in there now or whatever, but we've got some big decisions to make coming up in, uh, in the next election and do your due diligence out there, you know, to pick the right person because, you know, what, what's been happening and what's happening is not, it's not American and it's not what I signed up for. It's not the place that I grew up you know, the landscape doesn't look anything like it, it did when I was younger. And yeah, we should be evolving, but at the same time, there's certain things that just need to stay consistent and they're not. And so we have an, we have an op, an opportunity and an obligation as an American and a citizen that votes to put the right person in there. That's going to, that's going to put this ship on the right course. So yeah, that's I, it. I think that's great. You know, walking through life asleep is, is something we definitely can all take uh, take note from. So uh, again, this is Neil with Other People's Shoes. I want to continue to encourage you to listen to our shows and stay tuned next week as we have another guest on and uh, we'll get more into that. And again, I want to thank my guest, Sean, uh, and he is the host of Nowhere to Go But Up. Check that out as well on your favorite iTunes or other uh, podcast platform. So thank you again. Thank you so much for joining us on Other People's Shoes. Of course, you know, I'm your host, Neil Matthews, and I just want to say, wow, what did we just hear? 
what did we just experience? Sean's story is riveting, impactful, so much to it. And I thank him for his candor and I thank him so much for coming on and sharing his encounters with law enforcement and the FBI raid. I mean, all of that was just, I mean, I enjoyed taping it so many months ago, but now I'm enjoying that you get to hear what we got to experience so long ago. And now for our prickly pear announcement. Hey, we all got to eat, right? Why not go to 237 North Bart? Let Street in Medford and visit the Prickly Pear. There you can sink your teeth into the Cuban sandwich. Mmm or the mouth-watering Havana Bowl. Both crowd favorites. The Prickly Pear does catering for work lunches, parties, holiday parties, and weddings. The Prickly Pear is open from 11 to 3, Monday through Friday. Follow the Prickly Pear on Instagram under Prickly Pear 541. And also like them on Facebook under Prickly Pear. The Prickly Pear. Mmm. You'll leave there satisfied. I don't know about you, all that sounds delicious, and I'm so glad that we get to partner with the Prickly Pear. To come be a part of that gift card, giveaway it's pretty simple we are on facebook instagram and twitter and of course if you search those social medias you will find a picture of me in a gingerbread suit just comment right below that picture prickly pair 541 and you're entered it's pretty easy we of course are under facebook.com under ops podcast show instagram same thing ops podcast show under instagram and of course twitter it's a little different we're under people's shoes of course Hashtag it prickly pair 541 and you're entered. It's super easy. Stay tuned next week as we go out to the great state of Kansas, at least in our imagination, to the Jayhawk State. Oh, it pains me to say that as a Carolina fan, but don't let that deter you. We have a great guest. Remember, when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Of course, I'm your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas to you and have a great week.